Undoubtedly, one of the most common worries about naturalism in general, and atheism in particular, is the idea that they somehow undermine morality. This vague notion takes form in a number of distinct moral arguments for theism and against naturalism. There are several distinct types of moral arguments for theism, each of which focuses on a different alleged relationship between ethics and religion. I shall focus on only one type of moral argument, which I will call the meta-ethical argument for God's existence. This argument has been recently defended by William Lane Craig. The argument is based upon the idea that the existence of objective moral values and the non-existence of God are at odds with each other. From this view, and the premise that there are objective moral values, the conclusion is drawn that God exists. I intend to defend the position that this argument is not successful. The concept of an objective moral value plays a crucial role in Craig's meta-ethical argument for God's existence. Before summarizing his argument, it will be useful to review his definition of that concept. The literature on meta-ethics is rife with varying definitions of what it means for values to be objective. Indeed, in 1982, A.W. Price devoted an entire article just to cataloging the numerous conceptions of both objectivity and values. While it is beyond the scope of this paper to sort out all of the distinctions between different views of objectivity, the sheer diversity of conceptions about objectivity leads to one important observation. Given the varieties of objectivity and values, as well as the importance of objective moral values, hereafter objectivism, to Craig's argument, it is essential that we clarify precisely what he means by that phrase. The importance of a clear definition of objectivism has been echoed by numerous philosophers, theists, and non-theist alike. For example, R.M. Hare writes, hardly any moral philosophers give any clear idea of how they are using the terms objective and subjective. We must distinguish between various senses of the words objective and subjective. And Christian apologist H.P. Owen wrote, the notion of objectivity in ethics has been much discussed in recent literature, but in ethics as in other spheres, the words objective and subjective become the cause of serious confusion unless they are carefully defined. Finally, in the words of J.L. Mackey, the issue of the objectivity of values needs, however, to be distinguished from others with which it might be confused. Now, turning to Craig in his 1996 essay, The Indispensability of Theological Meta-Ethical Foundations for Morality, he provides the following definition of objective moral values. To say that there are objective moral values is to say that something is right or wrong independently of whether anybody believes it to be so. It is to say, for example, that Nazi anti-Semitism was morally wrong, even though the Nazis who carried out the Holocaust thought that it was good. And it would still be wrong even if the Nazis had won World War II and succeeded in exterminating or brainwashing everybody who disagreed with them. While this definition is a good starting point, Craig's own remarks suggest that he has more to say about the matter. In order to illustrate my point, allow me to distinguish between ontological and epistemological interpretations of objectivity. Moral values are ontologically objective just in case some moral claims are, in tr are true in virtue of corresponding to actually existing objects or properties that function as truth makers for the claims in question. For example, someone who holds that moral values are ontologically objective might maintain that the sentence murder is wrong is true because there is a real property, wrongness, and all moral acts that result in murder have that property. Moreover, all murders would have this property even if no one contemplated the moral status of murder and even if everyone thought that murder did not have such a property. Moral values
views are epistemologically objective, just in case some moral claims are such that they would be believed by all impartial or rational persons who consider them. The claims in question do not need to have an objective ontological foundation. An, epistemological, an epistemologically objective moral value might have no ontological foundation at all, uh, if it were logically necessary. An objective ontological foundation, such as if it corresponded to abstract, abstract objects, or an intersubjective ontological foundation, which would be the case if it corresponded to the moral beliefs of a group of people. For an example of an intersubjective foundation for moral values, consider Larry Arnhart's recent defense of an Aristotelian ethical naturalism rooted in the biological nature of human beings. On Arnhardt's theory, some moral values have an ontological foundation in the biological nature of human beings. Moreover, those moral values are epistemologically objective, since they are rooted in universal desires found in all human societies. Nevertheless, such values are not ontologically objective, since they are grounded in the subjective desires of human beings. In both his writings and oral debates, Craig is adamant that only ontological objectivity is acceptable. Turning again to Craig's 1996 essay, we find Craig quoting with approval the late philosopher Paul Kurtz, who states that the primary issue in metaethics concerns the ontological foundation for moral values. Quote, or again, the question is not, can we recognize the existence of objective moral values without reference to God? The theist will typically maintain that a person need not believe in God in order to recognize, say, that we should love our children. Rather, as humanist philosopher Paul Kurtz puts it, the central question about moral and ethical principles concerns this ontological foundation. If they are neither derived from God nor anchored in some transcendent ground, are they purely ephemeral?" End quote. Craig has emphasized this point repeatedly in his oral debates. For example, in his 2001 oral debate with Kurtz on ethics without God, Craig constantly accused Kurtz of not addressing his ontological points. In response to Kai Nielsen's defense of a coherentist approach to metaethics, and a corresponding epistemological notion of objectivity, Craig complained that Nielsen was incorrectly appealing to moral epistemology, not moral ontology. Indeed, indeed, Craig even had the audacity to accuse Nielsen of having confused the matter. Quote, here I think he, Nielsen, is clearly confusing the order of knowing with the order of being. In order to recognize that God is good, I may have to have some prior knowledge of what the good is in order to see that God is good. But that does not affect the fact that in the order of being, values derive their source from God's being. He's confused the order of knowing with the order of being. Simply because you can recognize moral values without belief in God, you cannot infer from this that therefore objective moral values can exist without God. Now, as, a, as an aside, I should point out incidentally that Craig's accusation here is scandalous. In his opening statement in his debate with Nielsen, he explicitly defined objectivism as objectivity without opinion. Craig did not state that he was using objective in an ontological sense. Nevertheless, when it was Nielsen's turn to give his opening statement, Nielsen addressed objectivity as ontology anyway. He said, quote, Mackey treats the problem of objective values as some kind of ontological question. It needn't be an ontological question. It's a question about whether certain moral values are rationally acceptable. That's the crucial question, end quote. In light of this statement, I think it is obvious that Nielsen understood perfectly well the difference between the order of knowing and the order of being. Nielsen simply adopts an alternative but mainstream definition of objectivity. 
the legitimacy of the epistemological interpretation of objectivity is evident from the fact that it is endorsed by many, if not most, of the contemporary philosophers writing on metaethics. During my own research on metaethical objectivity, I have observed over 29 contemporary philosophers who endorse an epistemological interpretation of objectivity. Finally, Craig's frequent emphasis on the existence of objective moral values indicates an ontological interpretation of objectivity. Thus, when Craig states, objective moral values do exist, I shall interpret him as stating there are ontologically objective moral values, or, in other words, there are moral values that are correct just because they correspond to something that actually exists in reality. Such moral values need make no reference to anyone's subjective states, capacities, conventions, beliefs, attitudes, or desires. Let's turn then to Craig's meta-ethical argument for God's existence. Syllogistically, Craig has displayed his argument with the following structure. One, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Two, objective moral values do exist. Three, therefore, God exists. While I am inclined to agree with two, it seems to me that Craig has overstated the case for one. Let's turn then to his first premise. If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Many critics of moral arguments for God's existence dismiss the entire project of arguing for morality to God on the basis of the Euthyphro dilemma. Are actions morally obligatory because God commands them, or does God command them because they are morally obligatory? One might even say that a discussion of the Euthyphro dilemma has become obligatory in a paper such as this one. Let us turn our attention, therefore, to that very topic. In the last 25 years or so, there has been a revival of the divine command theory among theistic philosophers. Part of that resurgence has included a variety of rigorous, erudite, and in-depth answers to the Euthyphro dilemma, answers that have been virtually ignored by Euthyphro proponents. My own view is that these intriguing defenses warrant a closer look, one that is well beyond the scope of this paper. My policy here, therefore, shall be to evaluate Craig's argument without making any assumptions about the prospects for the success of the Euthyphro dilemma. So let us turn then to the first premise of Craig's meta-ethical argument for God's existence. In support of premise one, Craig attempts to undermine the idea of objective moral values, or again, objectivism, existing without God. It is apparently Craig's contention that atheists who accept objectivism are logically inconsistent since objective moral values require a supernatural foundation. But is this in fact the case? As I read him, Craig's critique of atheistic objectivism consists of four supporting arguments. Let us examine each of his supporting arguments in turn. As Turning to his first supporting argument, as one, Craig, as one reads Craig's first supporting argument, it becomes obvious that he has yet to consistently adopt the sort of detailed and nuanced definition of objectivity called for earlier by Hare, Mackey, and Owen. Craig claims that if atheism is true, there is no ontological foundation for objective moral values. This remarkable inference is supposed to follow from the fact that if atheism is true, there is nothing special about human beings. Here is Craig's summary of this supporting argument in his own words, taken from his 1996 article on the meta-ethical argument for God's existence. Quote, if God does not exist, then what is the foundation for moral values? More particularly, what is the basis for the value of human beings? If God does not exist, then it is difficult to see any reason to think that human beings are special or that their morality is objectively true. Craig's first argument may thus be represented with the following hypothetical syllogism. 
Premise four, if God does not exist, then human beings are not special. Five, if human beings are not special, then there is no ontological foundation for objective moral values. Six, if there is no ontological foundation for objective moral values, then there are no ontologically objective moral values. Seven, therefore, if God does not exist, then there are no ontologically objective moral values. Now this raises a question. What precisely does Craig mean by the word special? The answer may be found in a passage written by J.P. Moreland that Craig approvingly quoted in his, Craig's, oral debate with Antony Flew. Quote, on an evolutionary secular scenario, human beings are nothing special. There is nothing intrinsically valuable about human beings in terms of having moral non-natural properties. The view that being human is special is guilty of speciesism, an unjustifiable bias towards one's own species. Thus, when Craig says that human beings are special, I shall interpret him as saying that human beings are intrinsically and objectively valuable by virtue of having non-natural properties. Thus, Craig's first argument may be reformulated as follows. For prime, if God does not exist, then human beings are not intrinsically and objectively valuable by virtue of having non-natural properties. And five prime, if human beings are not intrinsically and objectively valuable by virtue of having non-natural properties, then there is no ontological foundation for objective moral values. And we can leave premises six and seven unchanged. This argument, however, fails because its second premise, premise five prime, is plainly false. There could be ontologically objective moral values, but the foundation for such values could be something other than non-natural properties possessed by humans. Even if human beings themselves lack intrinsic value, it doesn't follow that all other things lack intrinsic value. For example, it is hard to see why claims like pleasure is intrinsically good and pain is intrinsically bad would depend for their truth on the claim human beings are intrinsically good. It could be the case that human beings are not special in Craig's sense, but abstract objects are the ground for ontologically objective moral values. Hence, ontologically objective moral values do not require that human beings be special. All that the ontologically objective concept of a moral value entails is that the truth of moral propositions is determined by correspondence to something that actually exists in reality. The identity of that something is not specified by the concept of ontological objectivity. In sum, Craig's sparse remarks about the alleged specialness of human beings provides no reason at all to think the specialness of human beings is a prerequisite for objective moral values, even when understood ontologically. Let's turn then to his second supporting argument. Following Michael Ruse, Craig argues that if naturalism is true, morality is nothing more than a biological adaptation. While the tribal morality evolved by Homo sapiens aids survival and reproduction, there is nothing about this species that makes its morality objectively true. Therefore, given naturalism, there are no objective moral values. Although closely related to his first argument, I interpret this to be an independent supporting argument. The essence of Craig's second argument is found in the following passage. As a result of socio-biological pressures, there has evolved among Homo sapiens a sort of herd morality which functions well in the perpetuation of our species and the struggle for survival. But there does not seem to be anything about Homo sapiens that makes this morality objectively true. He says, if there is no God, then human beings, quote, are just accidental byproducts of nature which have evolved, end quote. So one premise of the argument, then, seems to be eight. If God does not exist, then humans are the byproducts of naturalistic evolution. Furthermore, given naturalistic evolution, quote, morality is a biological adaptation, 
end quote. So another premise of the argument is nine. If humans are the byproducts of naturalistic evolution, then the human herd morality is nothing but a biological adaptation. Quote, but there does not seem to be anything about Homo sapiens that makes this morality objectively true, end quote. So the next premise is 10. If the human herd morality is nothing but a biological adaptation, then there is nothing that makes the human herd morality objectively true. How exactly does Craig proceed from this statement to the conclusion that objectivism is false on naturalism? The following excerpt provides the answer. If there is no God, then any ground for regarding the herd morality evolved by Homo sapiens as objectively true seems to have been removed. Some actions, say incest, may not be biologically or socially advantageous, and so in the course of human evolution has become taboo. But there is, on the atheistic view, nothing really wrong about committing incest." End quote. Thus, it appears that Craig is conflating there is nothing really wrong with there is nothing that makes the herd morality evolved by Homo sapiens as objectively true. So the missing premise is 11. If there is nothing that makes the human herd morality objectively true, then there are no ontologically objective moral values. From 8, 9, 10, and 11, he concludes 12. Therefore, if God does not exist, then there are no ontologically objective moral values. As with Craig's earlier supporting argument, however, this one suffers from equivocation. Naturalistic evolution at most shows only that on naturalism, our beliefs about morality are the product of evolution. It does not prove that there are no objective moral values. As Carolyn West notes, after all, it could be true both that there are moral facts out there and that natural selection has led us to believe that there are. Ironically, Craig appears to be guilty of the very thing he accuses his opponents of doing, namely, confusing moral ontology with moral epistemology. And therefore, it seems to me that premise 10 is entirely dubious. Moreover, if we return to Craig's stated definition of moral objectivity, there seems to be no reason why the objectivity of the herd morality evolved by humans is a necessary condition for ontologically objective moral values. In other words, it could be the case that the herd morality evolved by humans is objectively false, but ontologically objective moral values exist. But this entails that premise 11 is false. Let's move on then to his third supporting argument. His third supporting argument, if it can even be called an argument, is closely related to his second. According to this line of reasoning, on naturalism, there is no reason to believe that human beings are the source of objective moral value. Therefore, on naturalism, there are no objective moral values. Once again, it seems that Craig is playing fast and loose with the meaning of objective moral values. Whereas in the previous argument, he seemed to equivocate between objective moral values and the herd morality evolved by humans is objectively true. In this argument, he seems to equivocate between objective moral values and humans are the source of objective moral values, as can be seen from the following passage. Quote, but what I do not see is that in the absence of God, human beings are the source or the locus of objective moral value. On the atheistic view, they are simply complex evolutionary vomit that will eventually be swallowed up by the same cosmic process that coughed them up in the first place. And I don't see any reason to think that this species is the source of objective moral values in the universe. End quote. Therefore, Craig concludes, there are no objective moral values on naturalism. Now, what exactly is the argument here? If we strip out the provocative imagery of cosmic vomit, Craig's argument seems to be the following. Eight, if God does not exist, 
then humans are the byproducts of naturalistic evolution. 13. If humans are the byproducts of naturalistic evolution, then their existence is accidental. 14. If the existence of humans is accidental, then humans are not the source of objective moral values. 15. If humans are not the source of objective moral values, then there are no objective moral values. Finally, 16. Therefore, if God does not exist, <clears throat> then there are no objective moral values. There is something ironic about an avowed critic of secular humanism criticizing naturalism because it does not make humans the source of objective moral values. It is as if Craig believes there are only two possible sources of objective moral values, either God or humans. But no objectivist, atheists included, claims that human beings are the source of objective moral values. Indeed, the coherence of such a belief is doubtful. The whole point of positing ontologically objective moral values is to have moral values that are not dependent upon the subjective states of any person, including God. If humans were the source of moral values, then by definition, those values would not be objective. In other words, if the concept of moral values having a source entails that they were invented, then ontologically objective moral values do not have a source. Thus, premise 15 is false. Craig's third supporting argument is not successful. Let's move on to his fourth supporting argument. In oral debates, Craig is fond of appealing to a consensus of scholars as evidence for a conclusion. He often reuses the following line in his opening statement, which can be plausibly viewed as an independent supporting argument. Quote, if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Many theists and atheists alike concur on this point. He then appeals to J.L. Mackey, Michael Ruse, and Friedrich Nietzsche to support his claim that many atheists agree with him regarding God and objective moral values. Now, on another occasion, Craig defended the legitimacy of some arguments from authority by appealing to the late philosopher Wesley Salmon's textbook, Logic. Let us therefore evaluate Craig's argument as an inductive argument from authority in the logical form described by Salmon. Let P be the statement, if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. And let S be the relationship between atheism and objective moral values. Craig's fourth supporting argument may therefore be formulated as follows. 28. The vast majority of statements made by Mackie, Ruse, and Nietzsche concerning subject S are true. 29. P is a statement made by Mackie, Ruse, and Nietzsche concerning subject S. 30. Therefore, P is true. This argument does not satisfy Salmon's conditions for an inductively correct argument from authority in two ways. First, neither Ruse nor Nietzsche can be considered a reliable authority on subject S. With all due respect to Michael Ruse, he is not a specialist in either metaethics or the philosophy of religion. Nietzsche probably also fails to qualify as a reliable authority, at least by contemporary standards. The only philosopher listed by Craig who could legitimately be considered an authority on metaethics or the philosophy of religion is J.L. Mackey. A number of contemporary philosophers who specialize in metaethics, philosophy of religion, or both, however, have criticized the arguments of Mackey and Ruse. This leads to my second point. As Salmon observed, an appeal to one group of authorities has no evidential value when another group of authorities who are equally competent disagree. That is certainly the shortcoming of this argument, there are plenty of competent authorities on metaethics or the philosophy of religion, including both theists and naturalists, who disagree with Mackey about whether ontologically objective moral values require God. Craig has provided no reason to place greater confidence in supporters of Mackey's position than in his critics. Indeed, Craig does not even acknowledge those critics. But this entails that Craig's fourth argument provides no evidence at all in support of the idea 
that objective moral values need God. <clears throat> Having just discussed correct and incorrect uses of authority, I'd like to close this section with an observation regarding the current state of scholarly opinion regarding Craig's metaethical argument for God's existence. While Salmon is correct to emphasize that the testimony of an authority may not count as evidence when equally qualified authorities disagree, it is still worth emphasizing that the majority of philosophers, including non-cognitivists, atheists, agnostics, and theists, who have written on either metaethics or the metaethical argument for God's existence, agree that ontologically objective moral values do not need God. Although Craig's metaethical argument for God's existence is concerned with moral value, he has a backup objection focused on moral obligation. Even if ontologically objective moral values can exist without God, he says, they do not result in any moral obligations. He writes, if God does not exist, why think that we have any moral obligations to do anything? Who or what imposes any moral duties upon us? On the atheistic view, there is no divine lawgiver. But then what source is there for moral obligation? This conclusion is supposed to follow from the idea that moral obligation makes no sense without God, which Craig supports by quoting philosopher Richard Taylor. Quote, our moral obligations can be understood as those that are imposed by God. But what if this higher than human lawgiver is no longer taken into account? Does the concept of a moral obligation still make sense? The concept of moral obligation is unintelligible apart from the idea of God. The words remain, but their meaning is gone, end quote. Putting together the pieces, we have the following argument, which I shall call the lawgiver argument. 17. If God does not exist, then there is no divine lawgiver. 18. If there is no divine lawgiver, then there are no moral laws. 19. If there are no moral laws, then there are no moral obligations. Finally, 20. Therefore, if God does not exist, then there are no moral obligations. What should we think about 18? Craig offers no explicit argument for its truth, but it is not hard to imagine what such an argument might look like. One might argue for 18 on the basis of the following supporting argument. Premise 21. Laws must be made by a lawgiver. 22. A lawgiver must be either natural or divine. 23. Moral laws cannot have a natural lawgiver. 18. Therefore, if there is no divine lawgiver, then there are no moral laws. But why should anyone believe 21? Laws require a lawgiver only if they are, in fact, made. Government laws are the paradigm example of laws that require a lawgiver. But, to use one of Craig's trademark expressions, governmental laws began to exist. Not all laws are made, however. The laws of nature, logic, and mathematics are three examples of laws that are discovered, not invented. Not only do these examples undercut the support for premise 21, they actually provide the basis of an argument against 21 based on the following negative analogy. 24. The laws of nature, logic, mathematics, and objective morality did not begin to exist. The 25. The laws of nature, logic, and mathematics also do not have lawgivers. Premise 26, or conclusion 26. Therefore, the laws of objective morality do not have a lawgiver. 26 entails, accordingly, that premise 18 from above is false. In fact, we can take the argument a step further and show that God cannot be the source of of moral obligation in general. Perhaps the best presentation of such an argument is found in the following passage from the late J. L. Mackey's book, Miracle of Theism. Philosophers from Plato onwards have repeatedly criticized the suggestion that moral obligations are created by God's commands. The commands of a legitimate human ruler do not create obligations. If such a ruler tells you to do X, 
This makes it obligatory for you to do x only if it is already obligatory for you to do whatever the ruler tells you within the sphere in which x lies. The same applies to God. He can make it obligatory for us to do y by so commanding only because there is first a general obligation for us to obey him. His commands, therefore, cannot be the source of moral obligation in general. For any obligation that they introduce, there must be a more fundamental obligation that they presuppose. This criticism decisively excludes one way in which it might be thought that God could create morality. Since God's commands could create moral obligations only if there is a prior moral obligation to obey God's commands in general, God's commands cannot be the source of moral obligation in general. In direct reply to Mackey's argument, it is sometimes argued that a prior obligation to obey God's commands is unnecessary, since gratitude to God can motivate obedience to God's commands. The fact that gratitude to God can and often does motivate obedience to God's commands is not, however, of obvious relevance to Mackey's argument against God as the source of moral obligation in general. Moral ontology, not moral psychology. The relevant issue is whether moral obligation in general can be established by God's commands alone, not whether believers are motivated to obey divine commands even in the absence of a prior moral obligation to obey God's commands. It could be the case both that believers are motivated to obey divine commands even in the absence of a prior moral obligation to obey God's commands. Let me reread that. It could be the case both that believers are motivated by gratitude to God to obey his commands and God is not the source of moral obligation in general. I conclude that Mackey's argument provides an additional reason to reject the lawgiver argument. In addition to the falsity of premise 18, there are other problems with the argument as well. Consider, uh, consider the next premise, 19. If there are no moral laws, then there are no moral obligations. Even if there were no moral laws, it still wouldn't follow that there are no moral obligations. First. Intrinsic moral value can provide a foundation for moral obligation, and intrinsic moral values aren't ontologically dependent upon moral laws. As Eric Wielenberg writes, if I know that I can prevent some intrinsic evil without thereby introducing a greater evil into the world, or sacrificing some good, or violating some obligation, or doing anything else morally untoward, then I have a moral obligation to prevent the evil in question. Second, moral obligations can be derived from one's relationship with others. For example, even if there were no moral laws, parents can still have prima facie moral obligations to their children, such as the obligation to care for their children. Third, it may be the case, as argued by Linda Zagzebski, that moral law presupposes moral obligation. Somewhat simplistically, we may say that laws are generalizations. Moral laws are generalizations of moral obligations. And as Zagzebski explains, rationality leads us to see that obligations can be generalized, but generality is not a condition for the obligation to apply in any particular case. Therefore, the concept of moral obligation does not require a prior corresponding moral law. As McLaughlin once wrote, to call the moral law a law at all is only an inadequate metaphor for something that is sui generis. The metaphor is inadequate insofar as it connotates positive laws that have lawgivers and begin to exist. Since objective moral laws did not begin to exist, they do not need moral they do not need lawgivers. A better metaphor is the one suggested by Zagzebski that what many people call moral laws are generalizations of particular moral obligations. As we've seen, moral obligations do not require a lawgiver to create them. In conclusion, none of Craig's supporting arguments seem to be successful in showing that ontologically objective moral values need God. On the contrary, as we've seen, ontologically objective moral values cannot depend 
upon the subjective states of any person, including God. Moreover, Craig has not successfully shown that moral obligation requires God. Of course, this in no way rules out the idea that theism and atheism have very different ethical implications. More specifically, there may be other reasons for believing that some fact about morality requires God. Perhaps, for example, it could be shown that a deontological ethical theory is correct, and that some version of the divine command theory provides the best explanation for the various features of moral obligation. There may also be facts, such as the alleged heinous moral implications of biblical ethics, that provide evidence against God's existence. It is obviously beyond the scope of this paper to investigate such possibilities. The position I have defended is that Craig has not shown that ontologically objective moral values or obligations by themselves make God's existence more probable than not.